Hey up guys, it's Rory from In Light the Shadows here and we are a men's mental health group that is out there to support and make a difference. Our heart in Light the Shadows is to create media mindfulness mentoring in a way we can really impact men's lives so that we can see them transform and utterly be supported and poured out love upon their lives. Uh, so it's, even if men are just struggling with a bit of stress and anxiety or across the spectrum, all the way to if they're, they feel like they just want to end their life or be suicidal. So if that's you, if you feel like you, you have no reason to live anymore or you just need a little bit of support, if you need some guidance about how to bet your life, some of your mindsets and your strategies, uh, we'll be honoured to have you on the journey with us. Um, and you would say, welcome to the Brotherhood. Um, we don't claim to have all the answers, but we are just here for you, extending that olive branch to see you flourish in your life. And we just say, have a go, give it a go. You never know what could happen. Um, have a great day. Cheers, guys. Hey up everyone, welcome to Enlighten the Shadows. Today is episode 56 with Gary Devonport. We have got a man who's got a lot to share today. He's been through so much in his life and I'm, I'm grateful he's gone on the DM. He, sli he slid into my DMs, guys. Um, me and Gary have got to know each other through a similar passion of ours and we're going to talk about that, I'm sure, but we don't want to say what it is straight away because we don't want to lose you. Because there might, there might be some uh, haters out there. So yeah, um, Guys, thank you so much for joining us on the journey after two, two years or so. Um, I've had a really, really tough week. We've had our accounts hacked um, and I've done my absolute best to try and get them back. I've got two out of three back, but the one that I'm missing is the Enlightened Shadows Instagram account. So I'm gonna put a handle up on the screen. Um, you can give it a follow if you want, but there's, there's no fresh content on there. But I just wanted to kind of share a very quick lesson that I've learned. and. It's sometimes people take your kindness for weakness and then it tries to then make you change and become better. And this person hasn't changed me. I'm going to continue to be kind, continue with our mission with men's mental health and, and reaching in to help guys. But I was naive and I've learned a lesson. And sometimes people in this world give you sandpaper moments, I call them, where they rub you up the wrong way. It feels uncomfortable, it hurts, but there's a lesson to be learned there. And I, I learned in myself, the world is not against me, but it was really, really hard to get through it was five hours straight and still not fully there but i wanted to share that little lesson because sometimes buckets of crap come in threes and it was in more than three this week which i won't bore you with anymore because it's not about me but gary welcome to enlighten the shadows brother thanks rory it's an honor mate thanks for uh, thanks for having me on after i slid in your dms and invited you myself <laughs> <laughs> not, not a stranger but um yes mate we um we got to know each other on the way to leeds um man no it was liverpool wasn't it it was liverpool away yeah liverpool yeah it was on the on the car dr driving up and um i remember really fondly actually how you and i um instantly clicked with some of the things that we can relate to um with our, our mental health battles and you know i think you've got to find out that's what we do and and you, you you're into your podcasting as well so what yeah mate, I'm, I'm actually um i'm an ex-podcaster i'm retired um from from podcasting um we we folded talking shut up which obviously we're a leads podcast sort of three or four months ago um we are planning a sort of swan song but we haven't managed to um align as diaries just yet to uh, to make it happen so so yeah i uh, did podcasting for a couple of years really enjoyed it it became a bit of a passion um but then as you know happens in life kids family work uh, took over a little bit and i just couldn't find the time to do it anymore yeah, hundred percent. Family first. I think it's, that's that's such a hard thing, isn't it? As a bloke, that we we doers, we want to be, you know, chomping at the bit, you know, producing, growing, developing, helping, and if if you've got to juggle the plates and you're spinning them, thinking, push comes to shove, it has to be family. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, some say how, how selfish. Of course it is, but you know, people like us, we're not. I don't think with respect, we're regular guys where you know, with a nine to five mold and, you know, people do that. And that's great. That's what they are. But I think me and you strive to be different um, and try to push ourselves. And what I was really excited to share with our viewers today is, is where you've come from in your life and, and the um, battles you've had and not just metaphorically, but in real life, like you've got military background, you've been in the fire service now since then for quite a long time. And, um, I just think what you epitomize is like the typical masculine 
strong bloke. And I think what would be cool for our viewers is to hear like your vulnerabilities, which I know you're on a journey with because I've I've seen your TikTok account. So I'll put it on the screen for the viewers now, but I really love your TikTok account. Um, interestingly, we've gone for like a light bulb moment, bit of banter, life lessons, and that's it. That's all I'm using it for. Um, and then everything else we do is quite serious, but with yourself, your TikTok account's quite poignant, quite um, vulnerable to the point. So before we go to your past, what I would love for you know you to break down is what the heck got you, a, a bloke like you on TikTok, and what, what does your account kind of mean to you and what does it try to portray to people, if that makes sense? So <clears throat> with regards to TikTok, obviously I've done podcasting and been lucky enough to do some sort of media and stuff as well, you know, BBC and all that type of stuff. And um, I always try to use Talking Shut for good, if that made sense. So, you know, we tried to raise money for charity and all that type of stuff. And obviously when Talking Shut um, sort of finished, I've kind of lost that reach. Um, and not so long ago, about a month ago, I had a real sort of mental health breakdown. Um, and uh, for the first time in my journey through my mental health, um, I suffered really, really badly with anxiety. It was crippling. Um, and the, the physical symptoms that I got from the anxiety were so powerful. It actually kind of made me sit up and take notice a little bit that, that you know, we can sometimes sort of listen to people say, oh, I've got anxiety. And you kind of think, oh, you know, just feeling a bit anxious. But this this was so much more powerful than that. It literally debil debilitated me. So um, I, I happened to be away at the time. I was in London um, with, with work. And as a result, I felt about really alone. Uh, because obviously my support network was was back up north like um when i got back up home and you know sort of started um, addressing the issue i had i realized then that there's probably people who don't have the support ne network that i've got um now with regards to tiktok i uh, i literally had a tiktok account purely to well monitor what my kids were were seeing to be honest uh, monitoring what they were posting and things and um so I, I had had it for a while but just watching as you do scrolling through tiktok just wasting yeah, there's lots of them yeah, wasting days kind of thing of, of, of stuff. And um, I really, really toyed with the idea of should I set one up? And obviously it's got it's got a little bit of a stigma TikTok, you know, t dancing and, and, and stuff like that, which is obviously not what I use it for. But is it not? The, no, no, funny enough, it's not. But like the, the powerful thing for me was that if I, if I felt like that, then people without my support network felt like that, but there's no sort of relief from it because they didn't have someone they could talk to so I toyed with the idea for ages and uh, I played football on a Monday night with just a group of friends and uh, I toyed with it and I thought I'm going to do it and then I really kind of didn't want to put myself out there because it's you know it's, it's a bit of a strange thing um, and then I pulled up pulled up to football and thought oh, I'm for a penny and for a pound so just quickly knocked up a video and I like, really not, not scripted one take um, just explaining that I was, I was struggling with anxiety I didn't know where it had come from I, I didn't know sort of what was causing it but I knew that I was going to go on a journey to try and cure it and not cure it but try and understand what was happening to me and why I was feeling that way and literally that's what the, the video entailed um so I took the video uploaded it badly didn't really know what I was doing lobbed it in my car went and played football for an hour came back um and it just went insane um and I think I've had eight uh, eight five thousand views on that video um went from no followers to 1500 overnight um so many interactions with people in the same boat. Uh, and then mm. I kind of started trying to make videos around the stuff that surrounds that. So um, antidepressants, the stigma around around men's mental health um, and things like that. So so that's kind of where it came from. Um, I probably don't post as much as, as I could, probably don't make too much uh, engaging content, but I try. Um, so yeah, so that, that's basically why I did it really. Not Again, I, I said on the video, it's it's not for celebrity boxing matches that appear to be the main thing on there at the minute. And um, it certainly isn't for fame. I have no intention or no no appetite to ever be famous. I'm, I'm quite happy not being famous, but I just wanted to help people who might have felt the way I felt because it, it was a it was it was a torrid, torrid few weeks, to be honest. Thank you so much for sharing that, man. I appreciate that. And I think that's the thing about when you personally uh, have your battles with your mental health. Um, I think if you haven't had a major crisis as i'll call it um you know not just albeit anxiety but if it's you know depression uh, bipolar even schizophrenia psychosis um it, you know it could be um ptsd or other things but let's focus on anxiety because it's obviously you um it's so hard if you haven't felt it because mm -hmm. to, to tap into that empathy 
and we talked about this in last episode actually brother with with ian manning um he bravely opened up like you did uh, about lots of stuff which i won't be a spoiler alert so i'll put it on the screen for people to check after this chat but mate it yeah. was dynamite because if you didn't ever struggle with these things hearing these people and this is why we exist it's creating this content of bravery and courage of storytelling so that people can at least somewhat get a little bit of like oh, frick that that's that's powerful like we've got one of our boys on our team um coxie ash cox uh we had him episode 36 talking about um like traveling and, and self-discovery and he has never had a proper mental health crisis and yet he he didn't understand it and his mum did and his mum helped him to realize like you, you might not ever understand it but he, he then had a curiosity which is what you had in a way about self-learning about it and this is a really powerful point that you've made and he, he still to this day he doesn't know really what it's truly like but he says i i want to try to understand and i i think that's yeah. absolutely the antithesis of, of what we do and i'm sure what you're doing is try to help people who may not even ever struggle to at least have an open mind to empathize for it because there is i hate using the word but there is stigma still and i think with blokes yeah. like us it's so hard to unlearn all these strategies of years worth of learned decision making to go no i'll bottle it now nah, crack on now nah, man up get on with it you're all right i'll nah, shake yourself off all those you just keep doing it and i've done it this week i've had a terrible week and I've really struggled to articulate my pain <clears throat> of all these circumstances. So I want to thank you, bro. That, that, that's brilliant because I think that's where the journey starts ultimately for whether you do understand or you don't. It's that curiosity and, and asking a question so that you can empathize. Because I was like you with anxiety. I was like, you're just a little bit nervous. So I'm thinking, get on with it, crack on. And then I had my first t attack of anxiety. I was in Riverside Car Park, shopping thing in Nottingham. Um, just getting a ankle strap for an ankle injury, and then I sit in the car, bang it out of nowhere, mate. And it was like I, I couldn't move at one point. Mm. I could, I, I was physically like couldn't. I was just still. And then the anxiety in, internally was like overwhelming. And um, some of the viewers won't know this. That the people who were watching, you know, are curious if you promoted it. But I, I'm a Christian, so like. I prayed and I was like, God, what the heck is this? Like, I've not asked for this. And he's like, I'm not giving you this because I'm not that, but now you understand what it feels like. And I'm like, oh, shoot. So from that moment, I'm like you, where you go, I don't want this. I need to know where this is coming from and how can I, again, how can I help? So thank you, bro. What did you learn then in London about yourself in that moment? about this attack that you had that's why i call it because i don't think anyone laughs. yeah no definitely not i mean I, if, if i did ask for it i'd, I'd like to a receipt to take it back so I, I don't want ever want it again but um yeah um what did i learn about myself first and foremost uh, the vulnerability element that I, I think you touched on it a little bit i've, I've kind of i grew up in a sort of rough area and I've, I've been in what would be stereotypical masculine jobs and as a result of that you kind of put a put a stoic face on you kind of put a, a tough face on um and i've had a couple of times over my life where i felt like i've been broke down and that that mask has slipped and i i can only really liken it to going back to being a child again where you feel totally helpless uh, and and I, I that was the overriding fear but basically I, um i'd gone down on a conference in london i was staying in the um the docklands area of london uh, near the excel uh, conference center and I'd got down there on the, in the day and um, London makes me anxious anyway, if I'm being really honest, it's too busy. Um, and I, I'm just, yeah, uh, you know, it's a lovely place with lovely people, you know, with lo loads of sightseeing, but it's not really my go-to, if that makes sense. I quite like rural Yorkshire, but anyway. Um, so I'd gone down, traveled down there, a bit anxious about the tube and stuff like that. Never really a um, big fan of the tube. Um, got into London, uh, checked into my hotel, that type of stuff. Um, it was the night of uh, Uddersfield's um, playoff semi-final. Couldn't find anywhere to watch it, so decided to turn in early for a, for an early night. Um, turned everything off, sort of half nine. Dozed off to sleep pretty quickly. Um, woke up at 12 o'clock. I don't actually remember waking up, as in, you know, tr traditionally waking up, but um, I woke up and was just so fearful. Um, 
and it was such a primal fear as well. It was literally like somebody was trying to kill me. Um, heart was racing, mouth was dry, uh, felt really dizzy, couldn't catch my breath, couldn't settle myself, was pacing my room. All this point to the point of thinking that, do you know something, I think I'm actually having a heart attack here because I just couldn't get it under control. So in the panic, got some clothes on, walked down to reception and said, look, you're going to have to ring me an ambulance. I think I'm having an heart attack. Um, but I was just sort of delirious, not delirious, but sort of, I couldn't control it. I felt like I was spinning out of control. Yeah. Anyway, um, they rang the ambulance and said, oh, 45 minutes. So I sat down, had a, they brought me a glass of water. And as I sat down and sort of realised what actually what was happening to me, that I managed to set, settle down a little bit. Um, and so I went back in and said, look, cancel, cancel the, the ambulance. I don't want to waste anybody's time. Uh, and I, I, um, I shuttled off back to my, kind of my room, uh, rang my wife, which um, she, my wife's been a great, a great um, su support for me uh, through these times and um, managed to come up with some strategies. I used a Samaritan website to try and look at, um, you know, just some strategies to settle me a little bit. I tried breathing, and breathing techniques and stuff like that. It didn't really work, if I'm honest. Um, Bob Netflix on my laptop and, and managed to take my mind off it a little bit. Um, then obviously, finally, eventually managed to doze off to sleep, got up the next day and I got a conference to face at that point. Um, so you know, this conference was full of, from my profession, some really sort of big hitters, if you like. Um, yeah. So I'm there representing my service. So I'm sort of sat at the back of the conference room and really like really struggling to hold it together. Uh, just the, the fear of wanting to just walk out because I felt anxious. It was just so so powerful. Managed yeah. to hold it together. Could see what was happening to me, and then eventually, me it sort of eased to the degree of being manageable, but still being there. If that made sense. Um, so yeah, it was a it was a painful couple of weeks. Um, it was like being transported to being a child again. I um, oh. I became fearful of nighttime, which is strange in its in itself. I became I became fearful of being alone. If that made sense, not being able to text somebody, not being able to ring somebody, that type of thing. Um, so yeah, so I think the big the big take home for me was that actually, you know, I can be vulnerable and that's fine. That it's fine to be vulnerable. This is normal. Um, mm -hmm. It's just about understanding it and trying to grow, which is obviously the journey I'm kind of on now um, in terms of that. Amazing, bro. Thank you. Wow, that, that yeah. sounds pretty full on and and so tricky to navigate your way out of that. Um, and it sounds like you freaking did a good job. To be fair, mm, yeah, yeah, nice one. Um, I, I, I find this as well where people get stuck. Um, we, we also talked a little bit about this in the, in the last episode, how um, people play the mental health card. And so then societally, people don't have as much grace and empathy because they're hearing it a lot. It's like a buzzword now. And it's like, well, no, there's something that's shifted in our generation where an openness to understand things more an, an, an openness to feel and an openness to process and heal and that ain't ever going to look nice that ain't ever going to look pretty like that's that's going to be messy and mm. I, I find that it's so great to hear people like you coming on and saying these things because it, it, it needs to be said like it needs mm. to be out there and there's more men out there that are struggling like me and you have yeah. and yet they're, 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 they're just floating above the water they're just surviving and they still don't feel like it's okay to to open up and and i call it pandora's box it literally is like you don't want to open it you just holding it you're holding it short and you're thinking hey, i'm gonna be all right, i'm gonna be all right you carry it for years and yeah, then bang yeah. as soon as you open it it's a beautiful disaster like we're not selling it to people right now but <laughs> <laughs> you, you do you let it out and you have to go on this journey, this most incredible journey. Yeah. And, you know, I think we're doing a cracking job, mate. I think, you know, as people out there will take heart from, from our stories and, and, and we hope that they're watching this, like, look, it's, fellas, if you're watching Gary's episode, just come, come DM us, talk to us, DM mm -hmm. Gary on his, on his TikTok. Um, I know you can do that now, actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it, it came as a surprise to me when somebody did it the other day. I was like, what's did, this yeah. thing? Yeah. yeah. yeah there it's quality it's uh so it's making use of that because even i had that debate internally about tiktok i was like oh frick sake but yeah exactly what you alluded to and i thought i'm never gonna do it and i thought actually let's just be creative and there, there'll be a whole target audience of fellas that will be suffering but they'll be on that platform and yet 
you never you never would have reached into them because of because of your pride and your perceptions of what people yeah. think about you going on a platform like that. Um, so yeah, breaking down the barriers, man. Breaking yeah, down well, the that's barriers. That's what it's all about. Yeah. You alluded to going to back to childhood and, and you know sensing the kind of the, the night terrors and stuff like that. Um, as a young man, what what was because you said you had a tough upbringing? What was your experiences um, growing up in terms of self awareness, your feelings, um, any traumas you might have faced going into you know your twenties? Is there anything you could share in the highlight? Yeah, there's a, there's a fair few to be fair. Um, so as I said earlier, I grew up in uh, sort of Barnsley, late eighties, early nineties, which weren't really a great time for the community of here because obviously a lot of the industry closed in terms of the pits. Um, as a result of that, there weren't much money sloshing around the um, the parts of Barnsley that I grew up in. Um, so as a result of that, you know, school was pretty tough. There was a lot of, um, you know, tough tough men and tough parents. I mean, I go back, talk to my dad working down the pit, They're terrible environments. Um, and, and they really were truly tough men to work down there. It was an awful working environment. Um, so the, the culture around was that, you know, you had, you had, tough men who didn't show the didn't show their emotions at all mm. um i mean i think in my total life i've seen my dad cry once and that was his mum died i've uh, never seen him cry ever again since um but so yeah um, i grew up as an only child which again was a bit strange around here because a lot of people have brothers and sisters um so all, only child and um and i didn't really ha i had a group of friends that were friends but I kind of flitted between different pe different groups of friends trying to figure out where i kind of fitted in a little bit and as a result of being a little bit like this i um I got targeted a little bit um, by bullies as a kid, uh, and that really knocked my uh, knocked my confidence. That really uh, I felt like it exposed me. Uh, so then I, I developed these really like um, look back at it now quite clever strategies to avoid the bullying. Um, yeah. So I would catch a different bus. I would, uh, you know, and I, but I also managed to be able to. And I didn't realize I was doing it, but managed to sort of manage my own mental health as well. Um, so I'd get home from school at sort of three o'clock, uh, anxious that these, you know, these people are going to make me life a misery again the day after. But I got to the point where I could, I could park it, I could leave it, I could, I could tell, talk to myself and say, look, you've got 14, 15 hours before you've got to face that again. Don't waste them 14, 15 hours worrying about that. Just, you know, get on with it and then you know, cross that bridge again tomorrow kind of thing. So, so, so me, me early, me early years at high school were, were quite tough in terms of, of that. Um, and then, um, but again, my dad's answer to, to, to going home and telling, eventually when I told him I was being bullied was to, to punch him. That was like my dad's answer because that's the kind of environment he'd grown up yeah, yeah. in. Um, youngest of 12 himself, you know, they, they fought they fought the way up. Um, it sounds pretty cliche, but it was, it was the reality back then, um, which didn't really help me um, because I weren't really a fighter, if, if I'm honest, then. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, it was tough for the first couple of years and then, um, it kind of eased off a little bit. I, I started to stick up for myself um, rather um, against my own um, good nature a little bit. Um, being being formerly ginger before my hair fell out, I do have a bit of a fiery fiery side to, to my temper. It just takes me to get to that point. Um, yeah. And uh, they managed to push the right buttons and they got a reaction that they didn't particularly like and then it stopped. Um, but yeah, school weren't really for me, if I'm honest. I weren't particularly um, academic by any stretch of imagination. And because it didn't feel like a nice place to go because of these um, these experiences I'd have. I never really threw myself into it. The only element of school I threw myself into was sport, football, athletics, you know, the, the usual thing. Spent, again, it's cliche, I spent many an hour looking out the school window thinking when can I go out for PE, that type of thing. Um, so, yeah, so that was kind of it. And then um, I had a couple of traumas. Um, I witnessed uh, a girl who was killed in an accident, um, just happened to be there when it happened at the time. Um, and then you kind of go on that journey then as a kid of like going, oh God, you know, life's quite, quite um, precious, yeah. quite precious, you know, that's yeah. just messing about with a mate and then, you know, ne next Thanks. thing she's not here kind of thing. Yeah. Um, so that was like one of the things I can really remember. And then um, I had family who were in the military and because I wasn't particularly academic um, and, you know, you're, I had the career teacher saying, you're not going to make anything of yourself because you don't concentrate at school, you know, that, that type of typical thing from them times. Um, I naturally gravitated towards the physical element of the military um, and much to my mum and dad's dismay my mum and dad desperately wanted me to join the military and get a get a trade that was the that was the thing you get a trade so when you get out you've got something to do and I, I actually lied to him um, 
So I actually wanted to join the Royal Marines um, and I never yeah. managed to get there because the suspended recruitment for a short period of time around the time that I, um, that I was trying to join. So I was in and out of the careers office all the time. I was working in a banana packing factory at the time for Del Monte um, and I hated it, absolutely hated it. Mind-numbing work. Uh, but mum and dad were insistent that I got a job. So obviously finished school, got a job straight away. So then I kept going into the careers office and eventually the army recruiter was like, well, you know, you're hanging around, you're near all the time. Why don't you just, why don't you just join the army? And then it kind of sold me the dream of, of that regiment. So I kind of went back to my mum and dad and said, look, I'm, I'm going to join this regiment. My mum's like, oh, are you going to get a trade? And I, I lied and said, yeah, yeah, I'm, I'm going to become a, like a radio operator, which it wasn't a lie. It was a bending of the truth. I did become a radio operator. I didn't get me any qualifications. Um, so, so yeah, so then I went, obviously, um, through all the process of recruitment and then I joined um, phase one training in Scotland in the 3rd of December 2001 which obviously sort of coincided a couple of months after the World yeah, Trade no, Centre no. attacks yeah. so um, I kind of went up to training at, in Scotland um, with thought, sort of an eye on getting to my unit and, and becoming a tracksuit soldier really um, football, boxing, whatever um, because that was the thing back then. You could join the military and pretty much never be in uniform, just essentially be a professional sportsman. You could do that. Um, obviously, little did I know what was going to come sort of steaming over the hill um, a few months later. So, so yeah, I went to Scotland and did my first 13 weeks training up there. Um, and I'll be honest, um, the separation was, was, was tough initially, but then once you fell into a routine, it was, it was fairly, fairly, um, fairly okay, if that makes sense. And because of, obviously... I was already physically fit and because we didn't have a rate lock when I was a kid, it, like, it was not uncommon for us to not have the central eating on in, in, in winter and just be wrapped up in a duvet because my mum and dad couldn't afford the central eating. So when I got there and the heating wasn't on in January, it didn't bother sad. me in the slightest. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> like conditioned to it. So, so yeah, so I got through my, uh, I got through my phase one training, met lads from obviously all over the country, uh, some lads I still speak to today uh, from that time. Um, and sort of bimbled my way through phase one training where you really get to learn how to be a soldier. So it's ironing, marching, uh, getting shouted at a lot, um, running around, you know, that type of stuff, but very, very little sort of specialist training, if you like. Um, so got out of phase one training and then I moved down to Catrick in North Yorkshire to carry out uh, sort of my phase two training. So that will have been sort of early 2002. Um, got there and I, to be honest, I kind of found that I was naturally good at being an infantry soldier I was actually quite good at putting loads of weight on my back and, and marching miles and miles and miles and then pretending to kill an, an invisible enemy. And then, you know, um, I found I was naturally good at shooting, which is something I'd never done. Uh, I'm actually left-handed, so I used to shoot a pellet gun left-handed. I joined the army and they went, you can't shoot left-handed, you've got to shoot right-handed. So then I sort of found that I was naturally good at it. Uh, I could kind of just settle into it i find that weird but um so yeah so phase two training um i, I really loved it I, I you know I, I sort of grasped it loved loved it um i did i did flirt midway through to leave as, as most people do because it was tough i'll be honest it, mm. it physically and mentally is tough um you're, you're under a, a lot of pressure um constantly because the instructors want to see what you're all about they want to see if you can yeah they'll see it break you yeah they wanna, yeah that's it basically they the, the breakdown to build you back up, it's that type of thing. Um, but then when I joined the army, obviously, because it's what I wanted to do and I got into phase two, I kind of felt like that's where I belonged because obviously I'd had my school life where I flitted in between groups of people and they really weren't too sure where I kind of fitted in. And then I got there and I kind of thought, yeah, this is this is where I want to be kind of thing. So um, I left phase two training as best recruit and best shot. Um, and I think there's only a few people that's managed to win two awards as a leave training. So yeah. I was really lucky to, to get that. Uh, and then got posted to uh, Osnabrück in Germany, sort of late 2002, um, to, to join my unit, which is like starting all over again, um, because you get out there and, you know, you're, you're bottom of the food chain again. Um, so, yeah, that was that was a tough few months to settle in, because, again, you've, you've done your proving yourself in training, but it counts for nothing when you get to your unit. To prove yourself again, uh, mm. not not just as a as a soldier, but as a as a person, you've got to kind of do you fit in, you know? Because uh, not everybody does fit in, to be honest. Um, so yeah, so I got out to Germany in two thousand two, and it was fantastic. Uh, it was a, quite a lot of money, to be fair, for a for a young. Uh, and not spending much. Yeah, well, no, in Germany you could spend it. Um, it was oh, could you? Um, yeah, gotcha. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think at the time 
it was something like two euros to a pound. So basically we got quite a lot of money for being posted overseas. So I was taking home sort of 1500 quid a month, which was equating to sort of 3000, uh, 3000 euro, which basically you were sort of balling in Germany at the time. So it was like, you know, um, just jumping on trains and going to Amsterdam and just, just sort of trying to live, live the life a little bit. Um, but still with obviously the serious element of the soldiering in there and then uh, playing lots of sport and sort of, you know, just, just doing the things that a young lad does kind of thing. Um, and then obviously all that kind of changed coming to the end of sort of 2002 when there started being rumblings that actually we might um, carry out operations in Iraq. Um, my unit originally wasn't um, earmarked to go initially. Uh, because we were earmarked to go to Kosovo to do a peacekeeping tour. Um, and we came out for a parade one day, which used to do every morning, sort of like a, a school register, if you like. Yeah. And um, our our OC, the officer who commanded our company, came out and basically said, look, another, another unit are looking for volunteers to form part of their battle group to potentially... Um, potentially invade Iraq. I hate the word invade, by the way, but yeah, that was, was what it was, it was called. So... Um, I'd got to that point where I loved it and all that type of stuff. And obviously little did I know what was, what was coming kind of thing. I thought, do you know what? I actually want to be able to leave the military and say, I've done a bit. So I put my hand up, volunteered, had an interview uh, with me or C and the look at various things. And then um, we're lucky enough to get picked. So then I got posted away from my unit to another unit um, to start sort of pre-deployment training to, to go out to Iraq in, in 2003. Good to know. So a lot, of, a lot, a lot of changes, you know, a lot of um, transitional periods in your life. Which mm. tra- transitions a big thing, you know. When I was um, working in primary school, like the the transition, we had to do specialist transition uh, group work with kids because they'd, they'd get um, so riled up, or they would be really anxious, or they would they would go fight, fight, freeze, submit mode, or you know, it's the transition to to secondary school. So yeah, it's a big deal. You've you've changed. Um, environments a lot so you must be quite adaptable as a person for sure after all yeah that. P- possibly yeah, yeah. Um, that's what i've really thought about the thing is once you join the military you are part of a big gang um and it's a very close close gang if that makes sense don't get me wrong you don't always get on with everybody um it, that's just life that you know you're always going to meet people course, you don't yeah. particularly get on with but um you're always part of a big gang so even when you move from unit to unit you never really went on your own you went with, uh, with other people so there were i think there were sort of 14 between 14 and 18 of us who went to this other unit and which weirdly then makes you an even more tight a little gang because you're your you're your gang and then the, yeah, this yeah, gang yeah. kind of thing um so yeah so i i ironically um came home for christmas in 2002 no, knowing that i was potentially going to iraq in the year of 2003 um so came home with the intention to have a good christmas um so came home told my parents what potentially was happening uh, and then went back after Christmas and then ironically did all my sort of pre-deployment training, which is sort of weapons, tactics, um, practicing, things like that, um, in the snow in Germany. Um, so sort of doing live section attacks and, and, you know, living in the field for two, three weeks at a time in two and a half foot of snow when we're preparing in to go desert. to war in a desert. Yeah, so I, I remember sitting there at one point thinking, I'm absolutely freezing preparing to go to war in in a in a desert country Four, like 40 degrees plus better. yeah <laughs> I'm, I'm thinking surely we should have been in like cyprus or something and practicing there but um but yeah it, it was where it was um and then got a bit of, again got a little bit of leave just prior to then flying out to kuwait um i thought to kuwait and we were staged in kuwait in the desert for sort of a good couple of weeks while sort of all the political stuff carries on uh, in terms of I don't really remember it if I'm honest in terms of what the, the politics around it at the time was but you know they were sort of trying to get Saddam basically to to surrender uh, so we're all sat in in QA ready to you know if he refuses to to do what he's asked to do to go and um, sort of remove him by force which obviously is what ended up happening in the end. Yeah it got quite messy I remember I, I'm not much younger than you, but I remember it yeah. very, very clearly. And um, I think the whole thing was a mess. I think we went, yeah. we went in um, on certain intel, shall we say, that has yet to be definitively proven to this day. Um, and you just go, oh crap! And and unfortunately, you you guys are pawns. 
yeah, in the political yeah. realm. Um, yeah, we won't go into politics too much because that's what, you know we're not about that. But yeah, yeah. Um, it is important we talk about you know this is how we govern. This is the way we yeah, yeah. we control and we follow. And yeah, it must be quite. I can't even relate like how mad that must have been like in that waiting period in Kuwait, like waiting for them to, you know, all sorts of things you're probably thinking or, or experiencing. Like, what was that like? Like waiting? In- At the time, I probably didn't appreciate it. Now I'm much older. I can look back and, and, and view it probably with clearer eyes, if that makes sense. When you're there at the time, you're very much in it. Um, you're very much amongst it. So yeah, it was, it was, quite surreal from what I remember um as in like we were literally living in the desert there was nothing around there was no habitation at all it was just us in tents in the middle of in, in the middle of Kuwait and um the actual invasion time came and went quite a few times so we, we got stood up a couple of times right you're going tonight then it'd stand down again then it was like yeah you're going tonight and then it'd stand down again and all the time when this is happening you sort of ringing home um, but you can't tell them what you're not allowed to no. tell them what's happening. So it's kind of like ringing home, how's things, blah, 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 blah. What are you up to? Yeah, we're still out here. Um, couldn't go into specifics, um, you know, that kind of thing. And, and, and in the back of your mind, you're thinking, do you know what? This could actually be my last phone call for some time or, you know, in the worst case scenario ever. Um, and no. there's so many things you feel like you want to say, but you can't because you're not allowed. So then it's like, right, hang up, right. Put that to bed. I've got a job to do you know, put that to bed, then it gets delayed, then you, you, you relive that again, so then another phone call a couple of days later, hey, how you doing, blah, 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 that type of thing, live that again, and then I seem, uh, I remember that we had like a central sort of tent, like a socialising tent, um, and it had like a two Burko boilers at the back to get a brew, um, and then at the front was BBC World Service or Sky World Service, like just, just constant 24-hour news ticket taken over, and um, we'd gone in to get a brew, um, and basically the, the bombing of Baghdad had began. Um, and I remember being stood there with a cuppa, watching basically Baghdad being bombed. But my mind couldn't compute that that was happening while we was there, if that made sense. It was like, because mm-hmm. it's on a TV screen, so far apart. And I remember being stood there thinking, wow, this is insane that this is actually happening. And then um, they then started showing images of, of British troops moving towards the border uh, and the Americans moving towards the border, ready to go and sort of invade. And I'm still stood there with a cup of tea in QA watching this, thinking, hold on a minute, I'm going there in a minute. Like, we're, we're going. And then like the guy who, who commanded our wagon came in and went, right, lads, that mount up, we're going. And I remember like walking back and Flipping I remember out. like weird little things like, um, like we used to call it bombing your magazines up. So basically putting bullets in your magazines. And like little things like that, and like the 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 professional element of a soldier kicks in a little bit. So it's kind of mm. like you know, um, you know, planning preparation prevents you know poor performance. It was the saying. So we would check his gear over and over again. You would strip your magazines down, clean them, rebomb them, just so that if the worst comes to the worst, and you yeah, have to use your weapon in anger. It worked, yeah. So we got in the wagons, um, and I, I was in a warrior armored fighting vehicle at the time. So we were basically locked in the back of a tin can with no windows. Um, so off to your sort of right or left, depending on which side you're sat on, uh, just two sets of legs from the commander and the gunner who were stood with their head out the top of the wagon, but you're in the back. And like we were, we were, you know, armed, armed to the gills, to be fair. We had, you know, ammunition and weapons and we were, we were sort of all crammed in the back of this wagon. It weren't exactly, um, it weren't exactly great. It just sat sweating because uh, it was just insanely hot. And then um, we stayed it back at wagon for something like, maybe three hours I can't really remember maybe sort of three hours um over the border and you know basically just going up and down and um you've got no communications with the guys in the 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 turret either only only person who has is the section commander who sat in the back and he's got a headset on but it's that loud you're sat and you can't really communicate with each other so literally you sat there just with your thoughts really like sort of stewing your thoughts Um, and then we got over the border the door opened and uh, I always remember the door opening and, and there were guys today and he just said, welcome to Iraq. And then that was it. We were there. Um, and there were, uh, I seem to remember there was, uh, again, it's really hard. I don't really remember too much, if I'm honest, it's in clear, but there was lots and lots of people surrendering, sort of hundreds and hundreds of, because uh, Saddam's, ar- Saddam's army were largely made up of conscripts. So as soon as we came over the border, you know, armed up to the eyeballs, uh, they'd just surrendered um, en masse. Um, 
so there were lots of people and basically my my group of people we had a role that we protected the brigadier so we protected the guy who was basically running the battle for the entire british forces so we we basically was his protection wow um so we went over the border and uh, initially we didn't go too far forward we were still sort of midway between the front elements and the sort of rear elements but I got out of the wagon and they were like oh get get a brew on so got a camping stove out started to brew uh, brew up and uh, do this almighty crack and i mean it was really really loud and it felt like it was sort of next to me head um so having it drilled into you i took cover i just hit the deck like you're supposed to and this guy walked past me a couple and went what are you doing I said, i'm taking cover he says what are you taking cover for i said what, 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 what was that he went that's basically outgoing artillery. So it's basically the artillery gun liner behind us and the firing artillery oh, no. shells over, um, over our heads. And it was really break, breaking the, the air above us. And um, right. there was some, in a few days, there were some surreal moments. I stood there watching sort of attack helicopters and fighter jets and stuff, like doing gun, gun runs and bombing runs and stuff. And you're just like, this is insane. Like, it, it, it was really surreal. There's like some yeah. out of body moments where you're thinking, this is crazy. Um, yeah. So yeah, so that, that was it really. Um, like I said, we protected the brigadier um, for large amounts of the tour. So he used to go forward and see the units who were right at the very front who were sort of fighting. So we'd go forward to sort of the, what was deemed as the front line um, and we'd see um, we'd, we'd see how they were getting on. And it was kind of like a morale visit and he'd meet, he'd meet the commanders and stuff like that. And then um, we'd go back, sort of back a little bit and he'd, he'd league her up and we'd protect him while we league it, while we league it up. Um, and I remember he, he was quite—he was a good guy. He was, he was a Yorkshireman, and he requested Yorkshireman as his, as his protection. He'd actually that. requested that he wanted Yorkshireman to protect him. So it, we, although he was a brigadier and in the military, ranks a big thing. Um, he was quite cool to talk to. He was, he was pretty sta- pretty sound. Getting um, on one of days and I'm like gaffer out, you know, sort of how's the how's the battle going, kind of thing. Like, you know, have we have we lost anybody? And I remember him saying, "Yeah, we've we've had sort of four four fatalities or in the early stages of the fight. And, and that was a bit surreal as well, because that's when it kind of br- bring it, brings it home a little bit that yeah. actually, do you know what? Both sides of the of the battle, both sides of the divide, both the, the obviously the the um, the Iraqis and us, are, we're losing people, people are dying. Um, and then that that a little bit strange to kind of get your head around a little bit. Um, and yeah, and then I flitted between a couple of different roles while I were out there um, and then came sort of came home, I think in the... God, uh, June or July time, um, 2003. Um, but it was weird because we came home to like this sort of weird era's welcome. It was bizarre. Like we'd been in the local paper and um, we got told before we came out we had to grow his hair back because we'd all shaved his heads because obviously it was a million degrees. So, yeah. We got told we had to uh, grow his hair back because we didn't want to portray a bad image. Um, so we had to grow his hair back through again. So a lot of us grew his hair back. Um, and yeah, it was just... Again, just quite surreal. Like, looking back at it now, um, yeah, just, just surreal to be fair. Do you, do you have all these things like? Do you feel like you've become kind of a specialist at compartmentalizing stuff? Yes, uh, and I don't necessarily think that's a great thing at times. No. I do think that probably the compartment, and we'll they'll discuss sort of later on other experiences I've had. Um, the ability to be able to box it and hide it only lasts for so long you've got to deal with it at some point um otherwise it, it comes to it comes home to roost kind of thing yeah. um so yeah so that was it and then uh sort of my military career i came home and met me my now wife between uh between then i met her at um at christmas time have you new um, fresh trim yeah new fresh trim mate. i had good there then, by the way as well which is disappointing now but um yeah and we we ate it off we got engaged after sort of three months and then um i was still living in germany at the time uh, and then we were earmarked to go back to Iraq uh, for a second time, uh, sort of quick succession. So um, started pre-deployment training again. Uh, it was a little different this time. The, the sort of dynamics had changed inside Iraq by this time. And um, when the when we sort of come to the end of the the war, if you, if you like, we were seen in some parts as 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 saviors um, because Saddam was a, a horrible individual who really did oppress his 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 people. So when we removed him from power for a short period of time, we were we were suddenly like saviors, really. And 
you know, the Iraqis would lo love you. They would wave at you. They would spend time. They would bring you gifts. They were, you know, they, they, they wow. loved us. Um, and then obviously all that changed. And uh, when I came to getting ready to go back the second time, uh, obviously I was with my missus on, before you deploy, you sort of get five, six weeks off. And it was just, the fighting was so intense at the time out in Iraq. Um, the, the unit who'd been there before me, the, um, they had, a guy won the Victoria Cross, another guy won the Military Cross. They'd had lots and lots of casualties. Um, and I'm at home with my missus seeing all this on the telly. Mm. And it, it kind of became the elephant in the room a little bit where I knew I was going, she knew I was going. I was going to that place and it became to the point where we didn't really discuss it because of, it was, how do you discuss it? How do you discuss it? I've got to go. There's no two ways about it. Um, uh, yeah, so I, I redeployed again. Um, around my 21st birthday in the October time. Um, but this time I went for seven and a half months um, to a place called Alamara, which is sort of northern, north, well, mid, middle Iraq, sort of more northern to where the British troops used to sort of operate from. And it was a totally different different ball mm. game um, up there. Um, again, I did a winter tour, so the fighting was, was relatively calm. Um, we had a few sort of roadside bombs detonated against us and um, a couple of like small squ squirmishes, firefight squirmishes, but not, nothing um, on the sort of scale that went on to see in Afghanistan. Um, but one thing they used to do, our camp was like quite isolated and they used to just rocket us and mortar us most days. Um, so you'd, it, would, it became common to walk to the cookhouse and see a rocket flying over camp that somebody had let loose from town to try and hit us. It became common place uh, to be walking around camp looking for blinds yeah. for basically ordnance that had not gone off. Um, we had a couple that did land in camp, but they didn't detonate. Nobody were injured, that type of stuff. And and yeah, that that, that was it. And I found that tour really hard, if I'm honest, because we're separated away from my missus. Um, back then, you got a 20 minute phone card every Wednesday. You, you know, you had to handwrite letters. There was emails, but there's sort of eight computers for. A couple hundred people, yeah. Um, while I was out there, my school friend happened to be in the same camp as me, so I managed to go and see him. He's still serving in the military today. Wow. Um, but yeah, it was, a, it was a totally, totally different tour. And as I came towards the end of that tour, I kind of realised that, do you know what, maybe it's time for me to start looking at something else beyond the military. Um, because if I'm honest, I kind of got a little bit fed up of being told what to do and a little bit fed up of being away all the time. And when I come back, it, it was kind of Afghanistan was beginning to hot up a little bit and it looked likely that we'd begin to start doing operations in Afghanistan. So then obviously I'd potentially be away again. Mm. Um, so I got I got back home and uh, again, I got posted back to the UK early. Um, and yeah, I basically put my paperwork in to, to leave and, and get out with actually no real plan of what I was going to do when I got out. I just wanted to get out basically. No, no banana pack in there. Not back to the Del Monte. I don't, think had, I, don't, I don't think they would have had me back, to be honest. Um, I, I left kind of unceremoniously, so uh, I don't think they would have had me back. Oh, we're not going to go there. No, probably not Not best, yeah. Oh, shoot. Oh, man, that's brilliant. Um, thank you for sharing all this. Like, it's great. It makes my life brilliant. I just sit here and listen. It's fantastic. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I appreciate you going into such detail and depth because I know, I know there's a... Um, a, a strength and a confidentiality with a lot of, a lot of uh, military men, especially from the past where they don't really want to go there. Mm. They don't, they just, you know, it's almost like Vegas. It goes, what goes in Vegas stays in Vegas. It's kind of like, we'll just leave it. And that's that. And that's done. Um, so mm. thank you for sharing with our viewers and, and going into such detail. And I, I, can't, I can't imagine, like, I actually wanted to be a, a sniper rifleist in the, the army. And my mum was just mm. like, not like she was like I will disown. <laughs> she's like I will disown you if you go in the army. And I was like I really want to do it. Blah, blah, blah. I've still got this pathetic sniper um obsession. I've got like all like sniper books. Like um the the longest shot by um the um oh, what's his name Craig Sergeant Craig Harrison. Yeah, yeah. Um, unbelievable book to read. That um. Mm quite poignant quite sad in the end but very good read and then there's american sniper and sniper xbox games and we're like i'm just like a plastic plastic wannabe um but yeah. no i think well, well, when i was out in iraq the second time I, we actually heard about chris kyle 
um, American side. But that was happening at the same time I was there. Obviously, it was happening in Baghdad. But we, we'd actually heard about Chris Kyle. Um, he, like, you know, he, he was very well known um, in, in Iraq at the time. Um, so we, we'd actually heard about this American sniper who'd got, you know, a ridiculous amount of kills. Um, so, yeah, it's uh, straight. I mean, I had a similar obsession to be honest. I always wanted to be a sniper. I just never got the opportunity to go on the course to be a sniper. Uh, um, so it, it never happened, yeah. Laying in your freaking pissy pants all day. <laughs> mm, pretty much, yeah. Pretty much. <laughs> Shit. Put, uh, Pooping in bags, that was the... Uh, yeah, full on. Just, cu- yeah, bit, just cupping it, cupping it out. Bit, bit intense, yeah. Bit intense. Full on, mate. Well, no, yeah. um, you, you alluded to earlier, you said um, something about later on. I don't yeah. know if there's anything that you wanted to, to bravely open up and share that, anything you've battled through. Um, yeah, so when I obviously left the military, I then joined the fire service where, I'm, where I still am um, sort of today. Um, and... By this time, um, I've been in the fire service for maybe two years, and we had my son Judd, who you've met. Um, yeah, yeah. He's a, he's a he's a character. I think is the best way of putting it. But um, that kind of changed everything for me. Um, having kids, the the it made everything a little bit more clear, if that makes sense. Um, and some of the things that we encounter in the fire service, in terms of some of the incidents that we go to, um, do stay with you. There's I don't think there's any way of getting around it really, and. Um, I've since discovered that my anxiety is related to health anxiety. Um, it's related to my own health, uh, but it's related to my own health due to the, um, the fear that something happens to me and I can't provide for my family anymore. That's the sort of, that's where my sort of fear yeah. comes from. That's where my anxiety manifests itself. Um, so yeah, when I, when I joined the fire service and some of the incidents that I've attended, um, fatalities and uh, and 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 really 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 tragic accidents just kind of stay with you for a little bit and it's 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 sometimes difficult to not associate with it uh, as in sometimes it's difficult to not put yourself in the position of the person who's unfortunately been involved in it um now the fatality element is as absolutely tragic as it is has never really sort of manifested itself too much for me um, it's always the left o- the leftover, the, the the family element, collateral. the, the yeah. collateral. Yeah, that, that's the yeah. thing that's always sort of nibbled at me a little bit. And, you know, we due to the fact, obviously, we work in communities, it's not uncommon to attend an RTC, a fatality, and have members of the family appear. Uh, it's not uncommon to, you know, have members of the family start outside fires while their members of their family are in fires and things like that. And you can be exposed to sort of the collateral and... Um, I'm going through counselling at the moment, actually, and we, oh, we discussed well this in the last it's in the last counselling session. And uh, I do think that an element of sort of my entire life as a as a story to this point is probably elements of it that's led up to to where I'm at now with sort of the health anxiety thing. Um, so yeah, it can, it can be tough. Uh, what I would say that so I'm sitting here now in 2022, the um, the support the fire service offer now um, for for some of these incidents is is fantastic. Um, compared to what it was at, um, yeah, it's, it's really, really good. Um, they re- really do try and provide a good aftercare for, for some of the stuff that we encounter. But, um, but yeah, so that's kind of where it led, it's led me on this kind of journey um, yeah. to, to the point where I'm at now, yeah. No, that's quality, mate. And what, what was that like for you, having to battle with yourself to then to seek help and get therapy? Because I, there's, a, there's a massive taboo with that. Like, I've, yeah. I've had therapy. And multiple times I, I was offered it as a young lad um twice first time went to one not my cup of tea wasn't ready for it box mm. things too deep later on a bit bit of a leakage in my about 16 17 had a couple of sessions was all that i needed really and then um went through some more crap and then uh, got some uh, in the last year or so and i can't speak highly of it um, mm. to the point where I'm actually doing a level five degree in CBT. So I'd be actually accredited counsellor. So what, what we're doing in light and like, we're not just, you know, we are, we are working class lads and we, we are relatable and we're down to earth, but also we're going to have that bit of paper to safeguard ourselves and really come out with some, um, end product with people. So yeah, man, yeah. Uh, what, what's your, been your battle with like that taboo and, even even not just against society, but probably even within yourself, to get to the point where you've you've sought that help. Yeah, so 
I never, um, I never had, I had a spell on, I had a spell of low mood uh, in sort of 2018, uh, where I really just struggled with, with life. I, I really kind of was at a point where I'm thinking, I don't really know where I fit in. I'm not sure where, I'm kind of back to being a kid again, where I'm kind of searching constantly for where do I fit in? What, you know, what is, is this what it's all about kind of thing, you know? Um, and I, I really suffered with low mood to the point where I, I just couldn't motivate myself to do absolutely anything. Um, so I spoke to my missus about it, I went to see my GP, who at the time was incredibly um, unsympathetic, if I'm, if I'm honest. Um, and they uh, prescribed me some sertraline, uh, 50, 50 yeah. milligram a day of sertraline. Uh, and I started on that and it lifted my mood. Um, and, you know, that kind of kind of solved that, um, that sort of mood issue, uh, if you like. And um, around that time when we began talking shit and maybe, you know, maybe that, filled the void a little bit uh, around that time as well I started getting uh, well it was quite a bit before but I started getting promoted in the fire service like looking for a new challenge um, and then uh, I took myself off the surgery and after a period of time to start feeling better and then I had a I had an experience in 2020 during the pandemic where I took ill and I was uh, I was in hospital for five days um, first we suspect a blood clot on my lung that they managed to clear up and then they actually thought I'd had a heart attack um, so I had lots of tests and it culminated in having a, an angiogram where they basically cut a hole in your wrist. Apologies for anybody who might be squeamish. Uh, cut a hole in your wrist and pass a wire to your heart um, and then basically put dye into your heart and then it shows up on an x-ray and they can see all your arteries to see if they're blocked or anything like that. And it basically cleared it up and said that, you know, they thought that I'd had an heart, an heart infection brought on by COVID, believe it or not. But... Um, so I had this experience uh, and to be honest, I very much handled the experience like I was back on an operational tour. I kind of compartmented it and I was like, right, up to, up to dinner time, I'll do this, up to dinner, I'll do that, blah, blah, blah. They moved me into a room on my own. So I was like out of my bed, washing my socks in the sink, washing my pants in the sink really? because wow. I, couldn't, I couldn't bring it, the, yeah. they weren't allowed to bring anything in. So like for me to kind of form a routine, I was like, yeah, washing my clothes and like the nurse walked in, she was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm washing my grundies. And she was like, why? Well, well, I ain't got any others. And I've got nothing else to do. There's no telly, there's no radio. So I'm just going to do this. So I did that. Uh, but then when I got out, um, I then started really suffering with anxiety, um, waking up three, four o'clock in the morning, fearful of something, but I didn't know what it were. Mm-hmm. And then because of obviously what we were in at the time with the pandemic, um, and I just got out of hospital, and at the time they were saying the transmission rates in hospital were massive. So then like, I'd start with a little cough, and I'm thinking, I've got COVID. And then I'm not going to be able to, you know, look after my kids because we're COVID. And it basically, it just manifested itself to, to being a bit of a mess. Um, and the problem I had more than anything was that my anxiety, the, the emotional reaction to the anxiety was anger. So I was really, like, angry a lot of the time, just really, like, grumpy, not happy to be around, prickly, just, just not a good person. But when you're in it at the time, you don't really see it. You, you make excuses for why it is. Um, anyway, so... Uh, my, my missus basically in a roundabout way gave me an ultimatum that you need to sort yourself out of going and I was like fair enough so contacted work uh, went to my GP went back on the search and contacted work and they sent me for some counselling for the first time that I'd been to counselling um, and probably a little bit like yourself the, fir- the very first session I went to was a little bit, a bit like resistance to capture I very much gave very little away like, like my name date of birth that was it <laughs> and she, she was like sat across from me thinking this guy for real she's like asking me questions like one word answer boom done and she and yeah. but that was like me not wanting to open up a little bit and um but then I had sort of six seven sessions and we explored certain things and um I come out of every session I feel tired um yep. but it, it got me to a point where do you know what I felt much much better in myself uh, and I could I could rational rationalize my 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 thoughts and I also started looking into how the brain works and uh, and I started listening to podcasts like uh mentality that stevie ward does and yeah, yeah, he's got quality. he's got people on there who are you know sort of stereotypical alpha males who are explaining that and, you know and i kind of wanted to know why the why the process of this happening however i look back now and and what i'm going through at the moment and i think that that as, as useful as it was for me at the time can also be destructive because you can get to a point where you search to try and find out why you feel like that and you just go through bad experience after bad experience, searching for the one that's making you feel that way. 
But actually, all you do is perpetuate the cycle because you experience these bad experiences in your head again. It lowers your mood, and you just you just perpetuate the problem of constantly searching for the answer. And you're trying it's to not do the there. right thing, aren't you? By yeah. Go in there, and then it's actually just like a concoction where it's like just stirring yeah. it all up. Yeah, absolutely. I yeah. And I like um, when when my anxiety was bad in 2020. I would literally start being anxious about something that happened 30 years ago. Mm-hmm like an ill word to somebody or upsetting somebody or you know something like that uh, and it just became this this cycle but anyway I had the counselling and then again I, I uh, sort of uh, took myself off the search for lean again um, and I think because there's a, still a stigma around that as well you know um, I, I bring it up and discuss it I, I've got to the point now where I just talk openly it's completely openly to the point where I probably make people feel uncomfortable but yeah. I'm at the point now where if we can talk openly about it, you know, so like I'll go into work now. I'm a, I'm, I'm classed as a middle manager now. How, the, how that happened, I'm never, I'll never know. But like I, I go into work now and the lads will go, oh, wait, oh lads and lasses will go, what are you doing today? So I'm going to counsel them. And then there's a, like a little bit of a, <laughs> like, Just drop, mic drop. Yeah, it's like silence. Yeah, yeah. Like, but, but like, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm, and like we sit around and, you know, you get into discussions and stuff. And I'll say, yeah, I'm on, I'm on antidepressants. I take, I take a little pill every day and it just keeps me level a little bit. And, and yeah, I'm going off counselling, and yeah, and, I, and I'll openly speak about the issues that I've had because I feel like that is the only way we can truly begin to break the stigma down when more people will speak out. I mean, obviously we're friends on Facebook, and I, I don't know if we were at the time, but I, I basically just said, "Look, th- this is a photo of me. I'm smiling, but actually, I was in the worst place I could possibly be at that time. Like, I was really struggling. Couldn't like day to day was a struggle." Um, and I, w- I was shocked by how many people messaged me quietly on the side and said, God, I'm, I'm glad you've said that. I was having exactly the same thing. And then that's what's got me to this point now of, of I'm, I'm open about counselling. I'm open about taking antidepressants. I'm open, about, I'm open about suffering from anxiety. You know, I, I feel like I'm comfortable to do that. Some people might not be, and that's, that's cool as well. Um, yeah. But, like, I'm willing – I'm. I'm I'm a heart on the sleeve kind of guy. I'm an open book. If you ask me anything, I'll yeah. tell you. If I, yeah. if I like something, I'll tell you. Like if I do like something, I'll tell you. I'm, I'm you know I I I've got to a point where I'm comfortable in my own skin to the point of I don't need to impress anybody. I don't Come need on. to worry about all that. That's where it's stuff. at. I'm just there now. Uh, where so so counselling back to your original point that I've gone right around the hours. No no no, it's good. It's good. Um, is the fact that it's necessary. It's not for everybody. I get that. Um. But for me, it's good. I'm, I'm, I'm very much a talker, as we can tell. Um, so for me, it's good to talk about it. It's good to get it out. It's good to, it's good to have a second opinion on it because you sit sometimes mm-hmm. and you think in your head, you think, oh, is it because of this, 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 and this? And you can actually sit across from someone who's got, you know, sort of knowledge of how these things work. And actually you can talk through things and sort of un- unpick things and, and sort of put, put them straight kind of thing. And, um, and yeah, so so I'm currently ongoing with counselling now. I've got sort Amazing, of seven bro. sessions. I've had two. Um, but there's one other thing I really want to talk about um, that's sort of revolutionised my life. If I'm Come honest, on. Um, let's have it. Uh, my my boss at work um, when I I had me review and I said, look, I'm. She 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 said to me, she's you know, I, I have things in general. I said, if I'm honest, terrible. And she went, oh why? And then obviously I went and tell the story about my anxiety attack in London and stuff. And she put me on to another guy we work with who's actually a mindfulness coach, qualified, accredited mindfulness coach. And she was like, you should really go see him. And I was like, I'm not sure. I've tried meditation before and it's not really for me. I can't switch off long enough. I'm 100 miles an hour. Like, I, it's not, I'm not sure. I was really dubious. Uh, and I went to see this guy um, and it's absolutely changed my life. It's genuinely changed my life. Because the thing, the thing that I've discovered is that I ruminate in my own juices in my mind mm-hmm. and a lot of the time uh, some the health anxiety element of what i've got is i've been suffering since sort of march time with bad um sort of stomach bad stomach pains um which then perpetuated to the point of i was becoming anxious about the stomach pains the stomach pains got worse which made my anxiety worse and there was like mm. no middle ground um but what i, I looked into the sort of brain brain body brain gut connection and all that type of stuff yeah there is um, yeah there's a massive connection and then i went to see uh started, started sort of mindfulness with lee and there's a couple of things he's brought in that that just resonated and have just made my life manageable to the point of he said things like um obviously it's, it's teachings it's not his words but his teachings and he's like 
he says, the thing with thoughts is they are just that. They're not real. They're just thoughts. There's something that you're thinking that it's not happening. But where the brain works is it, you, the reaction to a dinosaur trying to eat you is the same of you re recollecting a bad experience as in the physical manifestation yep. of it that doesn't experience. know the difference it doesn't know the difference so now now with meditation which i, I now practice every day um mm. i've managed to be able to listen to my mind see when i'm thinking stop it and say thanks for that i understand that you're trying to protect me by saying that this pain might be this but actually it's not like there's no proof to it's that that's just what so i'm thinking good. so thanks for that believe it um and honestly i can't i cannot honestly and, and people are like looking at me going dev you're a heavily tattooed former soldier and you're telling me that you sit on your bed and meditate and i'm like yes i absolutely do and you yep. should try it too um but again it's not <laughs> Love it. it's not it's not for everybody it's no, not for no. everybody, but it, it really has changed my life um to be honest. So I'm, on a, I'm on an eight, eight week program on about week I'm, I'm on week four at the moment so yeah so good incredible so good. Honestly. love incredible. it man totally with you yeah. on that totally with you and you mentioned something that I want to quickly highlight for the viewers. You talked about you ruminate. So ruminate is rumination is overthinking. And so mm -hmm. fellas, if you are kind of relating to what Gary's saying about this, you know, your own worst critic, you know, you're constantly overthinking about things. Um, again, I'll put it on the screen, just, just DM and on his, on his TikTok. And yeah. um, I'm sure he'd be honored to help you when you're reaching into him. Um, one thing I watched last week, is uh eight mile do you know eminem's film that like, was mm -hmm. out i think it came out right around when you started going out on tour but um, yeah. it was like oh two ish and what's beautiful about that that last battle that he has is that he exposes all of his weaknesses about papa, papa doc the one who's like the big rival who, who's the champion and so he de-equips Papa Doc's rap because he exposes all of his own weakness, Eminem does, about his life, about what he hasn't got, about his, you know, his mistakes, all of those things. And so he's like, he's got no ammo. Yeah. And then and then he he's actually liberated. And this is what this is the point that I think we're on, we're on, I know it sounds a bit this is so deep, but I don't give a crap we're on the path of liberation and this is what I want to help other men come to the place to by watching these these chats is like you get men and some women rightfully from all walks of life bringing their two peas worth and throwing it in so that if someone just has one sentence one word that curiosity just sparks and then they go on that journey to liberate themselves I'm not saying we are the answer but hopefully these chats can be because once you get to the point like Gary Devonport and myself and Marshall Mathers, where he rips and exposes everything about himself, it's not about hanging your dirty laundry to have people pity you. It's coming to a self awareness and a self acceptance to then take ownership over these things so that you're free. And mm. once you get to that point, I mean, we're not quite there yet, but you can, you can, you can taste it. You can mm. smell it. You can, and it, and it's the the sweetness to it's good because you're thinking, I'm going to be free from this thing. I, as David Goggins says, and he's not everyone's cup of tea, and I'm very careful not to promote David Goggins on our groups because he's very down the line. Yeah, he says, make your demons your bitch. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm like, yo, that that is that is that is where it's at. Like essentially, you, you're by the by the mindfulness and and the meditation and the rationalizing of those thoughts you are you are mastering them and you're making them your slave not the other way around yeah and absolutely I think that's huge so mate this has been sick um before we do finish i want to ask you in light in the shadows question um which is anyone who's watching this and you know there might be some women we are a men's group but um they might be watching this and relate a lot to what you're saying um they might not but they, they feel utterly stuck and potentially they're like i don't want to be here anymore i don't want to end it is there anything you could just share with us like a small piece of bit of advice for them today yeah so my, my bit of advice would be that you're not alone it's a battle it's absolutely a battle um and it feels like a battle but you don't have to battle it alone you'll be surprised to speak out how many people will 
will care, will uh, want to help, will you know provide support where possible. You, you're not alone. No matter how how alone you might feel, you're not alone. And um, you know, I think the night is always uh, darkest before the sunrise. So as low as you might feel, tomorrow the day the sun's going to rise. It's going to be a different day, and you've got an opportunity to, you know. Um, face the new day with, with, with fresh eyes if you like but yeah don't suffer in silence you're not on your own bang love that absolutely love it mate it's been class I've re- honestly I've been privileged genuinely to listen to everything that you've experienced that you've shared and I'm yeah I'm blessed man because that's some really deep stuff and that's that's real that's, that's as raw as it gets and, and that is what we're about at Enlighten mate our, our mantra is real talk real men like we say how it is and that's that's why i personally think why we're different to most people because we absolutely unashamedly unapologetically say say how it is and we ain't yeah. we're in the bbc we're not we're not scripting it we're not deleting it we lay, we lay on the table and i think that's what men are looking for so thank you mate um anyone who's watching this we obviously are on youtube and the reason we are is we want to reach as many men across the world um, and get more subscribers. So if you could share the word, uh, like the video and subscribe, what that does guys, it, it increases the reach. So there might be men, you know, there could be freaking in India, there could be Africa, you know, North America. And with our videos, it gets more influence to them. Therefore it will be a suggestion on their YouTube. So if you could click the subscribe button, that'd be amazing. We appreciate you. Um, as we put throughout the, the videos, we've put our private Facebook chat group. That's got like close to 600 men now um and it's absolutely dynamite I'm, I'm telling you now you will get nothing but love and encouragement on there <clears throat> there's men that have, have similarly struggled in different ways as well and they pour out love and you won't feel judged i i, I absolutely 100 percent that so um check that out if you can or if you bravely want to if not not a problem carry on watching our videos and then um we're on social media like i say oh, for sake, we're, we're gonna get that account back i'm, I'm believing <laughs> it um and you know what the hacker's not gonna make me bitter so we'll leave it at that and um gary's um tiktok we'll put that on the screen right now if you feel inspired by his story this is why i'm certain this is why he's done it he just wants to help and so give him give him a dm um but guys thank you for joining us on episode 56 with gary davenport and next week we have uh, another guest for you lined up because it, it it's in the pipeline so and i've got another person as well ready so it's going to make some slightly stuff i don't want to say any more than that join us next time um thank you so yeah cheers gary mate cheers man thank you